Turning in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you'll be following along your handout real closely. I've got a lot to cover tonight, but I want you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to be covering the next two Bible covenants that God cut with man. We're going to be covering the first one tonight is the Mosaic Covenant, M-O-S-A-I-C, Mosaic Covenant covenant. Remember, there are eight main Bible covenants that God himself cut with man. And of these eight, there are six that are unconditional covenants. And there are two that are conditional covenants. We've covered one of them the very first night. The Edenic covenant was a conditional covenant. And the Mosaic covenant is the other conditional covenant. Now, who were the participants in this covenant? This covenant was cut between God and the nation of Israel through Moses. Moses is the mediator of this covenant. He acts as the representative for Israel. He stands in for the children of Israel when God is cutting this covenant with Israel. What's the scripture of this covenant? Almost all of the first four books of the Bible. The scripture of this covenant begins in Exodus chapter 19 and goes all the way through Deuteronomy chapter 28. The scripture of the Mosaic covenant covers Exodus chapter 19 all the way through Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look at your handout. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, three months after Israel came out of Egypt, they came to the foot of Mount Sinai. In verse 3, it says, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Does this sound familiar? We read this scripture for eight weeks when I taught on the series, How to Mount Up with Wings as Eagles. But now look at the very next verse, where God states some of the terms or conditions, and the provisions or blessings of the covenant. Verse 5, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my commandment, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now what's the terms or conditions of this Mosaic Covenant? Obedience. Obedience. What's the provisions or the blessings of the Mosaic Covenant? God began to list the blessings if the children of Israel kept the covenant. He begins to list them in verses 5 and 6. God said, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me. You'll be a kingdom of priest. You'll be a holy nation, God says. This is some of the blessings and provisions that God says you will receive these if you are obedient, if you obey me. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about God making and sealing this covenant through Moses, we're going to cover a lot of this when we get to the blood covenant. So tonight, I'm just going to point out some of the main key elements of the Mosaic Covenant. The key provision of the Mosaic Covenant was the law of Moses. The law of Moses. It contained not just 10 commandments, but 613 commandments. 613 commandments. 365 of these commandments were negative commandments or things that were forbidden. You can think of as thou shalt not. 
365, thou shalt not. You, want, you are not to do this and this and this. God lists them. And then there are 248 of these 613 commandments are positive commandments, are things that should be done. You can think of these as thou shalt. You are to do this and this and this, and God lists them. 613 commandments. Now, could they possibly keep 613 commandments? They couldn't even keep the Ten Commandments. While Mo was up on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, the people were down below breaking the Ten Commandments by worshiping that golden calf. The people could not keep the Ten, much less the 613 Commandments. So God established a key element of the entire Mosaic Law, which was the blood sacrifice. The blood sacrifice of animals for the atoning of the people's sin. God stated the purpose of the blood sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Look at your handout. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now remember, the blood of animals could never take away the sins of the people. The blood of the animal sacrifices could only atone, which means to cover the sins of the Old Testament saints. Only the blood of Jesus can remove or take away sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. You can jot that scripture down. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. And Hebrews 10, 16, verse 22. Now, let's briefly look at a list of the blessings and the curses of the covenant. There's always blessings. There's always curses to the covenants that are in the Bible. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, this chapter lists the terms of the Mosaic covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. And it shall come to pass if... Thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to obey, to observe. God is saying, listen, if you hearken, you are to listen diligently to the voice of, of the Lord. You are to observe, you are to obey, you are to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. And he begins to list the blessings of the covenant in Verse 1, the middle part of the verse and down, the, the Lord says that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. That's a blessing. If you are obedient and if you obey my voice, God says. In verses 2 through 3, the, God says, all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if... Thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Verse 3, God says, blessed. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Look at verse 4. You'll be blessed in the fruit of your body, and the fruit of your ground, your cattle, your flocks. We don't have time to read these verses in detail. I'm, I'm just giving you the key words out of them. Verse 5, God says, Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. In other words, you'll be blessed with provision and prosperity. I like that blessing, don't you? Verse 6, God says, Blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in. and You'll be blessed when you go out. Verse 7, God says, Now, if you obey me, if you, if you keep my commandments, if you do what I tell you, verse 7, your enemies will be defeated. They'll come against you one way and flee Seven ways. Hallelujah. Verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessing. Oh, I like that, don't you? Not just blessing coming, a little bit, a trickle, a, a little stream, but God says the Lord shall command the blessing. I want God's commanded blessing to overtake me. The Lord shall command the blessing upon everything you put your hand to do. Men in business, that is for you. God will command his blessing upon everything you put your hand to do. Verse 9, the Lord shall establish thee a holy nation unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if, if, 
Thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Verse 10 is another blessing of keeping the Mosaic Covenant. All people will be afraid of you. Verse 12, you will have rain, God says. God says, I'll bless all the work of your hand. You will lend and not borrow. I receive that one. I want to be a lender. I want to be a giver. I don't want to be a borrower. Verse 13, you'll be the head and not the tail. You'll be above and not beneath. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to be beneath do you? I want to be above. I want to be the head and not the tail. All right, that's the blessings. Verses 1 through, through 15 is the blessings of the covenant. Now look at verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And God begins to list the curses of the covenant. Verse 16, you'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the field. Verse 17, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Curse, curse, curse. Every verse from verse 16 through 68 are all of the curses for breaking the Mosaic law. There's the verses 1 through 15 are the blessings. Then verses 16 through 68 are the curses. There's a lot more curses to breaking the, the law than there are to keeping them, aren't they? Now, what is the token or the symbol or the sign of the Mosaic Covenant? You remember Every covenant that we will study that God cut with man, he made a sign. He gave them a token, a symbol of the covenant. Do you remember the, the covenant God made with Adam? The, the token was the tree of life. The, the Noahic covenant, the covenant God made with Noah was the rainbow. That's right. That is right. So there's a, there's a token, a, a symbol, a sign to the covenants. And the, the token, the sign, the symbol of the Mosaic Covenant is the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Look at your handout. Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 18. Exodus 31, 12 through 18. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep. For it is a what? Sign. It's a sign, a symbol, a token betwixt me and you throughout your generations. And in verses 14 and 15, I, I won't have time to read it all. We've got so much to cover tonight, but I'm just going to read excerpts of verses 14 through 16. God says, you shall keep the Sabbath. And God says, you are to work six days, but then the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. And God says, anyone who works on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Verse 16, they shall keep the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Now, this part, this stipulation of the Mosaic covenant carries on forward to the next covenant that we're going to cover in a few minutes. This part, keeping the Sabbath, God says you are to keep the Sabbath for a perpetual covenant. You're to keep the Sabbath from now on, God says. Verse 17, it is a sign, it is a symbol, it is a token between me and the children of Israel forever. Why? Why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So if God himself rested on the seventh day, God says, I want my people to rest on the Sabbath day. Verse 18, and he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon, the mount, upon mount Sinai, he gave unto Moses, watch this, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Think about that. 
God gave unto Moses when he made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So God gives Moses the terms, the conditions, and the token, the sign, the symbol of the covenant while Moses was up on Mount Sinai. And Israel was down below breaking the law while God is giving it, while God is writing the commandments with his finger upon these tables of stone. The children of Israel are down below breaking them. And you read over and over and over from Exodus all the way through Deuteronomy where the children of Israel broke the covenant continually. They could not keep the Mosaic covenant. But Jesus came and he fulfilled the law and did away with the Mosaic covenant, which was a conditional covenant. How do we know that the Mosaic covenant was a conditional covenant? Does God require you to bring a lamb to church every Sunday and offer that lamb upon the altar as a burnt offering, as a burnt sacrifice in order to receive forgiveness of your sins? No, the Mosaic covenant was a conditional covenant, and it was done away with. It was fulfilled when Jesus came and became the main sacrifice for the sin of all mankind. Look at your handout, Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If, you, if you don't know what you've been delivered from, read Leviticus and Numbers. If that won't make you shout to know you have been delivered from that. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. For Christ is the what end of the law? Done complete. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. The law or the Mosaic covenant, now listen, did not end with the coming of Jesus. The Mosaic covenant did not end with the life of Jesus. The Mosaic Covenant did not end as long as Jesus was alive on earth. Jesus was under the Mosaic Covenant and had to obey the commandments. But the law and the Mosaic Covenant ended with the death of the Lord Jesus. The Mosaic Covenant did not end with the coming of Jesus. It didn't end with his life while he was here on earth. But the Mosaic Covenant ended with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are no longer under the law. And we do not have to obey the 613 commandments because Jesus fulfilled the law. Galatians 3.19, talking about the law, says the law was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who's the seed? Jesus the Messiah. The law was temporary. It was added until the seed which is the Messiah, came. Now that the Messiah has come, the law and the Mosaic covenant is finished. It's ended. It's a conditional covenant. Jesus' blood is better blood than the blood of animals. It's better blood, Hebrew says, than the, than the blood of bulls and goats. The blood of Jesus is better blood than the animals of the old law. The blood of bulls and goats and lambs could not take away sin. Only the blood of Jesus, the lamb, takes away sin. Hallelujah. Now, again tonight, I want to do a comparison. I love, I love to do comparisons. I love to do types and shadows. 
So we're going to compare Mo with Jesus. We're going to see that Moses was a type and shadow, a picture of Jesus. I'm going to give you some some list and don't try to write them down or keep up I'll give you the I'll give you the chart at the end Moses evil king Pharaoh tried to kill him as a baby Exodus chapter 1 verse 22 King Pharaoh commanded that every child be thrown into the Nile River what about Jesus King Herod tried to kill baby Jesus Matthew chapter 2 verse 16 he commanded all male children under two years old to be killed. Moses was hidden from evil King Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 2, verse 2. Moses' mother hid him for three months. What about Jesus? An angel said that Jesus was to be hidden from the evil King Herod. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. What about Moses? Moses was sent down the river in Egypt in order to preserve his life. Exodus chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Moses' mother made an ark and put Moses into that ark, and he floated down the river. He was sent there to preserve his life. What about Jesus? Jesus was taken into Egypt. To preserve his life. Matthew chapter 2 verses 13 through 15. Now, what about Moses? There was a long period of silence from Moses' childhood to his adulthood. From the time that he was an infant and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Then he was 40 years old. Acts seven twenty three says he was 40 years old the next time that... that you hear anything about Moses. What about Jesus? There's a long period of silence from his childhood to adulthood. He was 12 years old in the temple. You don't hear another word until he began his public ministry when he was baptized of John the Baptist. Moses became a prince in Egypt. Exodus chapter 2 verses 10 through 14. He was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. He was in line for the throne. What about Jesus? Moses was a prince. Jesus is the prince of peace. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says, Jesus is the prince of life. Acts chapter 3 verse 15. Moses was meek. Numbers chapter 12 verse 3. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, I am meek and lowly in heart. Moses did miracles on or to large bodies of water. Exodus chapter 7, verse 20. He turned the Nile River into blood. Exodus chapter 14, verses 16 through 27. That was the next, one of the greatest miracles that was performed. The Red Sea parted. What about Jesus? Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. He spoke to the storm and said, Peace, be still. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 51. Jesus came unto the disciples walking on the water. They both did miraculous things on or to large bodies of water. Moses fed hungry people in the wilderness, Exodus chapter 16. The children of Israel were always complaining, we're hungry, we're hungry, so God sent them manna. We're hungry, we're sick of manna, so God rained quail down. Moses fed hungry people in the wilderness. It was Moses' prayers that God that caused God to send the, the manna and the quail. Jesus fed a multitude in the wilderness. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. The disciples said, where can we get bread in the wilderness? And they had seven loaves and a few small fish. But they didn't even need that because they had the bread of life himself right there with them. What did they need bread for when they had Jesus? He said, I am the bread of life. Moses Provided water for thirsty people. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 25. 
When they came to Marah, the water was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. So the children of Israel started complaining that they couldn't drink the water. And God showed Moses a tree. And Moses cut down the tree, cast it into the bitter waters, and the bitter waters were made sweet. Jesus went to the tree of Calvary. And you can cast the tree of Calvary into the middle of your bitter situations and your bitter circumstances and the bitter water of your life. And the bitter circumstances will be made sweet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Moses provided water for thirsty people. Jesus said in John chapter 7 verse 37, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Moses went from being a prince to a pauper. Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. Pharaoh was going to kill him, so he fled to Midian, the backside of a desert. What about Jesus? He went from being the Son of God and even one, the, one of the Trinity, one of the Godhead. He went from being God to becoming man. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. They said, Is not this Jesus, the carpenter's son? He went from being God to being a man. Moses went from being a prince to a pauper. Moses saved women at a well. Exodus chapter 2, verses 15 through 19. There were seven women that came to a well, and the shepherds tried to run them off, but Moses helped them. He saved women at a well. Jesus saved a woman at a well. John chapter 4, the woman came. She had a conversation with Jesus. She left her water pots, went into the city and said, Come and see a man that told me everything that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Jesus saved a woman at a well. Moses became a shepherd. Exodus chapter 3 verse 1. He became a shepherd in Midian. Jesus is called the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. Oh, but not only is Jesus the good shepherd, but he's called the great shepherd. He's called the chief shepherd, and he's called the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Hallelujah. So both Mo and Jesus were shepherds. Moses' mission was to redeem Israel from slavery in Egypt. Jesus' mission was to redeem mankind from the slavery of sin. Mo had outstretched arms with two men beside him with war going on around him. In Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 13, you remember they were the children of Israel was in a battle, and as long as Mo held his hands up, the children of Israel were winning. But he, when his hands grew weary and he let them down, why, the children of Israel would begin to lose the battle. And so... Aaron and Hur held Mo's hands up. So there, two men held his hands up. They were on either side of him while war raged around him. Jesus' arms were outstretched between two men on crosses with the kingdom of darkness waging spiritual war all around them. Matthew chapter 27, verse 38. Did Moses and the children of Israel win the battle with those two men? Holding his arms up? Yes. Did Jesus, in the middle of those two men on the cross, but on the crosses beside him, did Jesus win that spiritual battle? Yes. Can you not see how Moses is a picture, a type of Jesus? Mo was often rejected by his own people. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, and Acts chapter 7. Verses 23 through 27, Jesus was often rejected by his own people. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, and Matthew chapter 27, verse, verse 22, the Jews cried out, crucify him. His own people cried out, crucify him. They rejected him. Mo was a prophet. 
Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10, Jesus is a prophet. John chapter 6, verse 14, Mo spent 40 days fasting. Exodus chapter 34, verse 28, Jesus spent 40 days fasting. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus and Moses Look at the similarities between them. Moses performed signs and wonders. Jesus performed signs, wonders, and miracles. Moses offered his life for the salvation of his people after they sinned with the golden calf in Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 and through 32. Moses said, if you don't forgive their sin, then blot my name out of your book too. Moses offered his life for the salvation of his people. Jesus offered his life for the salvation of the world. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 15 through 21, Colossians 1, 19 and 20, Colossians 2 verses 11 and through 14, 1 John 1 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. These are just a few of the verses that tells you that Jesus offered his life for the salvation of the world. Oh, and listen. Mo takes a Gentile bride. Exodus chapter 2, verse 21. Mo married Zipporah in Midian. Jesus takes a Gentile bride, the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul writes and says, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Hallelujah. Look at the similarities between Moses and Jesus. And finally, look at your handout. The victory song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is sung. Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Revelation 15, verses 2 through 3. And I saw them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his mark stand on the slant of glass having the harps of God and they sing the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous are thy works Lord God almighty just and true are thy ways thou king of saints hallelujah hallelujah glory to God the song of Mo and the Lamb. I like it, don't you? Amen. Glory to And we'll get to sing it too. Hallelujah. We got something to look forward to. To sing the song of Moses. And to sing the song of the Lamb. Hallelujah. I could stay on the Mosaic Covenant for weeks. But we're not going to. We're going to cover the next Bible covenant that God cut with man is called the land covenant. The land covenant. This covenant deals with the land known for centuries as Palestine. So this covenant was originally called the Palestinian covenant. But in our day... Because of the unrest in the Middle East by all the Palestinians, this covenant is now called the Land Covenant by modern Bible scholars. The Land Covenant is an extension of the Abrahamic Covenant because, you remember, God promised the land of Israel to Abraham and Abraham's seed forever. Now, what type of covenant is the land covenant? It's an unconditional covenant. Who are the participants of this covenant? God, 
and the nation of Israel through Moses. Again, Moses is the mediator of this covenant. He acts as the representative of the nation of Israel. Just as in the Mosaic Covenant, there's a lot of similarities between the Mosaic Covenant and the Land Covenant, formerly called the Palestinian Covenant. Now, the Land Covenant was not made with the children of Israel who came out of Egypt. The first generation of the children of Israel that came out of Egypt broke the Mosaic Covenant. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they died without entering into the Promised Land. So this Land Covenant was made with their children. The first generation died in the wilderness, so the Land Covenant is made with the second generation of the children of Israel. The second generation that came out of Egyptian bondage, the first generation died in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb were the only two of that first generation to make it through. The rest of them died in the wilderness. So God established the land covenant with the second generation. Now, what's the token? What's the symbol? What's the sign of this land covenant? Again, it's the Sabbath, just the same as the Mosaic Covenant. God said, you are to keep my Sabbath for an everlasting generations. So the, the sign, the, the symbol, the seal, the token of the land covenant is the Sabbath. The people were to rest on the seventh day, Exodus chapter 23, verse 12 you can jot that scripture down. There was also a Sabbath rest for the land. They were to let the land rest every seven years and not plant crops. Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 through 11. Also Leviticus chapter 25, verses 2 through 7. You can read about that. God commanded them to let the land rest every seven years. God said, I'll bless you so much in the sixth year till you won't have to work that seventh year. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we got a year off from work every seven years and we didn't have to do anything for an entire year? Yes, I would too. Amen. And do you know the children of Israel would not keep the Sabbath rest? They wouldn't keep the weekly Sabbath. They broke it. They broke the seven-year Sabbath for the land. And that's why they went into slavery. That's why they went into Babylonian captivity. God said, you won't let the land rest? I'll let it rest. You'll be in captivity for 70 years till you make up for all of those seven-year Sabbaths that you did not let the land rest. Was that not dumb or what? But if we had lived back then, I'm sure we would have been just as rebellious and disobedient as they were. Now, what's the scripture of the land covenant? The scripture for the land covenant is only... A chapter and a half. It's Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 1 through chapter 30, verse 20. So it's all of Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verses 1 through 20 of chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside or in addition to the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now, if you look at this and think about it, this verse clearly shows you that this land covenant is separate from the Mosaic covenant, which God gave Moses on Mount Sinai in the land of Horeb. God gives the land covenant when the children of Israel are in the plains of Moab. Look at it. 
Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 1, shows you two distinct separate covenants. God made this land covenant with when the children of Israel were in the plains of Moab. They were by the Jordan River getting ready to cross over into the promised land when God established and cut the land covenant with Moses and the children of Israel. Now, what were the terms and conditions of the covenant? Obedience. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 9. God says, keep therefore the word of what? This covenant and do them. So is this a covenant? It must be if God said, you are to keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them. Why? That you may prosper in all that you ye do. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 12, God says that thou shouldest enter into what? Covenant with the Lord thy God and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day. Do you remember I told you last week that covenants, that especially the covenants that God cut with man, there was always an oath involved in the covenant. And an oath, you remember, means to seven oneself. You said the oath, the terms, you swore, and you repeated the the terms seven times. You seven yourself. You swore the oath. And God's, because there wasn't anyone greater That he could swear by God, swore by his own self to keep the words of of the covenant that he cut with man. So in Deuteronomy 29, 12, now look at it one more time. That thou shouldest enter into the covenant with the Lord thy God and into his oath which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day. The importance of the land covenant is that it reaffirms the title deed to the land belonging to the nation of Israel. Even though the children of Israel will be disobedient, they will break the covenant, but the right to the land is never taken away from Israel. And I don't care What nations come against Israel today, that land belongs to the Jewish people. And any nation that's foolish enough to try to attack them and think that they're going to take it, God says it's their land. He cut a covenant in order to establish the land covenant. So do you think any man is going to take that land away from the children of Israel? Not going to happen. What's the blessings of this land covenant? The blessings are stated again. They're read again. They're recited again from Deuteronomy chapter 28. I told you there's a lot of similarities between the Mosaic Covenant and the Land Covenant. The same blessings are stated again. Deuteronomy chapter chapter 28, verses 2 through 13. God instructed them to read those again to people that they would and tell them. Get it established in their minds that if you enter into the promised land, you're getting ready to go in. Now, if you'll be obedient to me, you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. You'll be blessed in the fruit of your body, the fruit of your ground, the cattle. I'll give you seasonal rains. You'll be blessed, 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 blessed. But he also reminded them about the penalty for disobedience. The curses stated in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 through 68, they were read again to the people. And then God tells Moses, when the people go into the promised land, I want the blessings and the curses of the covenant to be read to the people again. That'll be Three times. Look at your handout. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 29. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it. Now, what's he talking about? God says, when you go into the promised land, when you take possession of the land that I promised you, when you get into that land, thou shalt put the blessing, God says, upon Mount Gerizim, 
and the curse upon Mount Ebal. And God is instructing them as to what they are to do. When they get into the promised land, they are to write out the blessings, verses 1 through 15 of Deuteronomy 28. They are to write those out, to put those on Mount Gerizim. And then they're to write out, and then they're to read the curses on Mount Ebal. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 2 through 8. God said, now when you get into the promised land... I want you to set up huge stones. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 2 through 8. God said, when you get into the promised land, I want you to set up these huge stones. I want you to put plaster on these stones, and I want you to write upon them all the words of this law. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 2 through 3, God is telling them, on the day that you go in, I'm, going, I'm giving you the, these instructions. This is what I want you to do. Verse 2, God says, I want you to set up great stones, huge stones. Put plaster on these stones. Verse 3, and thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law, God says. And then he instructs them to build an altar. And... God is giving them detailed instructions about what they are to do. In verses 12 through 26 of Deuteronomy 27, the priests representing six of the 12 tribes, God says you're to stand upon Mount Gerizim and you're to read the blessings of the covenant. And then the priests representing the other six tribes of the children of Israel, they were to stand upon Mount Ebal. Verse 13, and these shall stand upon, upon Mount Ebal to curse, not to curse the people, but to read the curses. And he lists the six tribes that are to stand upon Mount Ebal and read the curses of the covenant. Now think about it. You've got these two mountains on either side, and you've got the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, down in the valley in between these mountains. And you've got the priests shouting out on, on Mount Gerizim. You've got them shouting out the blessings. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 15. Now look. In the last part of verse 15, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen, Amen, Amen. As the blessings and the curses are read, the people are standing in the valley below and they're saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. And I can just picture them back, just swaying back and forth as the priests are, are reading the blessings. All of the people are saying, Amen. I can just, I can just picture the scene that day. And when they're when they're priests are reading the blessings on Mount Gerizim, the people are down below going, "Yay, man! We're gonna keep the we're gonna keep the law. We want the blessings." And then on Mount Ebal, when the curses are read, at the end of every one of these verses, at the end of verse fifteen, the people shall answer and say, "Amen." Verse sixteen, the people shall say, "Amen." Verse seventeen, and all the people shall say, "Amen." So they, as the curses were read, the people down below in the valley we're saying amen amen all the words that god has spoken we will do but did they no. no were they obedient to keep the covenant no they got into idolatry and all kinds of wickedness and sins they broke the sabbath and as a result of them breaking the land Sabbath and not letting the land rest on the seventh year, they were taken into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 29. In verses 14 through 30, Moses speaks prophetically about Israel's coming disobedience to the covenant. Moses was a prophet, and he prophesies and tells them exactly what they're going to do. He prophesies about their coming disobedience to the covenant. And as a result of them being disobedient and breaking the covenant, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1, Moses speaking prophetically, 
He's telling them that they will be scattered over all the nations of the earth. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 2, Moses prophesies that after that period of time, that the children of Israel will repent. And then in chapter 30, verse 3, Moses prophesies the Messiah's return. Look at verse 3. Then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Moses is prophesying about the Lord Jesus, the Messiah's return, and that he will gather the children of Israel, from all of the nations that they've been scattered. Verses, the last part of verse 3 and verse 4 is prophesied that, that Israel is going to be regathered. Verse 5, Israel will possess the promised land. Verse 6, God will circumcise their heart and they will love God with all of their heart. Verse 7, the enemies of Israel will be judged. This is a prophecy that, that God is speaking through his prophet Moses. And in the end, Israel will receive full blessing, especially the blessing of the messianic age. And we will be a part of this. Hallelujah. The land covenant is confirmed centuries later in Ezekiel chapter 16. Look at your handout. The prophet Ezekiel. Zeke speaks prophetically about God's relationship with the people. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, God recounts his love of Israel in her infancy when she was first formed. And in Ezekiel 16, verses 8 through 14, later... God chose Israel to become his wife. Verse 8 of Ezekiel chapter 16. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, and I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Now, I've put this in your handout. Look at it. The word skirt in Hebrew is the is Old Testament. If you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, it's number 3671. The Hebrew word for skirt is kanaf, K-A-N-A-P-H, kanaf, and it means an edge or extremity, specifically of a bird or army, a wing, a wing of a bird, or a wing of a garment, or bed clothing, or a flap of a garment. When God said to Israel, I'll spread my skirt over thee, he was saying that he took them into his care, just as an eagle bears her young upon her wings. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 11 and 12. The phrase where God said, I will spread my skirt over thee, that phrase in Bible days was symbolic of marriage. Ruth chapter 3, verse 9. Ruth said to Boaz, spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaiden, for thou art a near kinsman. And God said to the nation of Israel, I've spread my skirt over thee, and thou becamest mine. God married the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is God's bride. Hosea chapter 2 verse 16. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, which means my husband. God told them, you won't call me Bali, which means Lord or Master, but you'll call me Ishi, which means my husband husband. Hosea chapter 2 verses 19 through 20. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. Isaiah became the wife of God's covenant. Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. 
The Lord hath been a witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. The nation of Israel is God's wife. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Ezekiel chapter 16 verses 10 through 14. It describes how God decked his bride in beautiful wedding garments of gold and silver and fine linen jewels and put a beautiful crown upon her head in verse 12 of Ezekiel chapter 16 and in verses 15 through 34 tells how God's wife Israel the nation of Israel was not faithful to their husband God but they played the harlot they committed spiritual adultery through worshiping false gods. They broke the Mosaic covenant. And in verses 35 through 52, God says, therefore it was necessary for him. He had to punish her by allowing her to be taken from the land for a time and be taken into captivity. Oh, but God says in verses 60, in the first part of verse 60, he says, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth. God says, I'll remember my land covenant that I established with me, with you. And I promised you that the land is to be yours forever. And then God says in the last part of verse 60, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Verse 62, I will establish my covenant with thee and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. The everlasting covenant is the new covenant which the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, our beloved bridegroom, established with his own blood. The church is the bride of Christ. Yeah. The nation of Israel is the bride of the Father God. But the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. Paul writes to the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. I have espoused you unto one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. The New Jerusalem is not the bride but is prepared it's pre it's a picture of the bride the bride of Jesus that is adorned for her husband revelation chapter 21 verses 9 and 10 and there came unto me one of the seven angels and talked with me saying come hither come here and I will shew thee the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and shewed me that great city the holy Jerusalem Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Revelation chapter 22 verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints and he saith unto me right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he saith unto me these are the true sayings of God the church is 
the Lamb's wife, and she is clothed in, the, in a wedding garment of fine linen, clean and white, just as God clothed his bride, Israel, in the wedding garments of gold, silver, fine linen, jewels, and a beautiful crown upon her head. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 12. In heaven, God the Father will be joined to his bride, Israel, throughout all of eternity. And Jesus, the Son, will be joined together with his bride, the church, throughout all of eternity. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says, And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Revelation 22, 20, Even so come, Lord Jesus, come and get your bride. Amen. Woo. Woo. Glory to God. Woo. Glory. Shoot. 